So as we resume on part two, we want to kind of go over these highlights. And uh, we've gone over how the Black Knight was given hospitality by the clerk of Cotmanhurst. Now we see where Cedric and Athelstane and Rowena, their whole group, uh, they're traveling towards home. And uh, they've, they've left the tournament. And they're going to get jumped here in just a minute. There's going to be an ambush. But I want to comment a little bit about Athelstane. Athelstane is the character who has got a pure Saxon ancestry. And he is the one they're hoping that when the Normans are defeated, eventually Athelstane or his descendants will become the next kings. And they'll get back to having Saxon kings limited kings, more freedom for the individual. They're hoping for that if they can get rid of the uh, uh, Normans. And of course, that's Cedric's hope. That's all of their hopes. Now, Rebecca and Isaac, uh, of course, they are the, uh, the two Jewish people in the story. They are stranded in the woods, but they're aided by Cedric's party. So Cedric's party comes up on them and with Cedric's party is Ivanhoe on a litter or a stretcher. So a stretcher, you know, where a wounded person is uh, put is uh, often called a litter. And then, uh, of course, Rebecca is, uh, you'll find, uh, has a desire uh, to exercise herbs and medicines. And she's got uh, a real talent in nursing and being, uh, you know, medicinal, kind of medicinal uh, herbs and, and medicines. And so Rebecca, you're going to see increasingly, is going to be showing these healing skills that she has. And uh, so as they join together, shortly after that, the entire group is attacked by bandits in the woods. And they are led by Maurice... De Brassi or De Bracy. So De Bracy's group, or as the French would say, Maurice de Brassi, and uh, Brassi's group ambushes them, and in the midst of this ambush, Girth and Wamba both uh, escape. They get into the woods, and they they are aided by Loxley. Now Loxley is a figure in the woods. He's a forester. He lives uh, there. He hunts deer illegally because it's the king's woods and the king will not let common people uh, hunt the deer. And just to get let you guys know, and you may already know this, but Robin Hood, he's the Robin Hood of the story. So uh, he's not called Robin Hood, but he is that same character. And um, so he helps them, but the group that is captured, you know, that has Rebecca and Isaac and Cedric, that whole group is taken by De Bracy to the nearby castle of Reginald Front de Boeuf. Reginald Front de Boeuf. So he's one of the Norman lords. He's right under King Prince John, and the common people hate. The Normans, so they hate him, and uh, so now they're they're kind of held in prison in Front de Boeuf's castle. So, uh, by the way, Front de Boeuf in uh, French, we get the word beef or cattle from boeuf. We get word beef from that, and de means of, and front means face. So. Um, face of a of cattle or a cattle face is really what his last name means so he had someone in the past someone in generations past who was not a real good looking guy his face looked like a cow and so uh, anyway the name uh, stuck So let's take a look at this great description of Cedric. And of course, Cedric is this, uh, I mean, he is interesting. He's the uh, 
kind of the example, great example of the Saxon. And he's so exemplary of the freedom loving Saxon that they actually call him Cedric the Saxon. So let's look on page 25. If you would turn down to about the middle of the page, here's this great description. Middle of page 25. And for those of you that might be in a different edition, we're in chapter 3, and we're about um, six paragraphs into chapter 3. It appeared indeed from the countenance of this proprietor, Cedric, that he was of a frank but hasty and choleric temper. So choleric means he is uh, hot and hot-tempered. Um, so he's, uh, you know, he's, he's got a lot of emotion in his temper. He was not above the middle stature but broad-shouldered, long-armed, and powerfully made, like one accustomed to endure the fatigue of war or of the chase. His face was broad, with large blue eyes, open and frank features, fine teeth, and a well-formed head, altogether expressive of that sort of good humor which often lodges with a sudden and hasty temper. So we have... Right there, we know he has a sudden and hasty temper. So please uh, underline this section or just bracket it in the margin. But I would underline sudden and hasty temper. Pride and jealousy there was in his eye. For his life had been spent in asserting rights which were constantly liable to invasion. And the prompt, fiery, and resolute disposition of the man had been kept constantly upon the alert by the circumstances of his situation. So, uh, what, a, what a great quote that is. Let's continue. His long yellow hair was equally divided on the top of his head and upon his brow and combed down on each side to the length of his shoulders. It had but little tendency to gray, although Cedric was approaching his 60th year. His dress was a tunic of forest green, furred at the throat, and cuffs with what was called Minerva, a kind of fur inferior in quality to ermine, and formed, as it is believed, of the skin of the gray squirrel. This doublet hung unbuttoned over the close dress of scarlet, which sate tight to his body. He had breeches of the same, but they did not reach below the lower part of the thigh, leaving the knee exposed. His feet had sandals of the same fashion with the peasants, but of finer material and secured in the front with golden clasps. So we're going to draw a picture of Cedric, and I had mentioned uh, last week we were going to have a picture of him, so here it is. We're going to go ahead and Put him up here as good as well as we can from the description. So from the description, we have here Cedric. He's got this green, I don't have any color, but he's got this green tunic. So let's go ahead and make this diagram. And he's got his yellow hair. He's a blonde. Here it's parted down the middle. And uh he uh, says his hair doesn't tend to go gray because he's, even though he's close to 60, he's not gray and, uh, you know, pretty youthful. And then it says it's furred, the, uh, the tunic is furred at the throat. So he's got this great deal of fur. And, of course, that tells us that it's cold in England. It tells us that they like having a fur collar. And this is Minerva, and uh, Min excuse me, Minerva, Minerva. That's how you say it. And it's inferior to ermine, but it's probably the skin of a gray squirrel. And this doublet, this uh, forest green doublet, hung. So I'm going to open up the, the middle here and uh, try to erase. This little piece right here. There we go. And come back with it. 
and try to kind of fix it up. The doublet um, hung unbuttoned over a close dress of scarlet. So he's got scarlet, and the scarlet actually, uh, these pants come down to his knee. It kind of covers just above the knee. So he's got uh, his feet uh, below, of course, and uh, let's take a look at what he's wearing down here. So he's got his knees. I can't really do a good kneecap there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, his uh, pants are of scarlet. So he's got this scarlet, uh, these pants that hang, that come down, down to just above the knee. And uh, leaving the knee exposed. His feet had sandals of the same fashion with the peasants, but a finer material and secured in the front with golden clasps. So let's go ahead and put sandals. Then he's got kind of a fine uh, pair of sandals, and they've got golden clasps. So that's kind of a uh, put down here. A gold clasp. Let's go ahead and put scarlet breeches. And this gold clasp is probably kind of a, a status symbol. He's got a gold um, ball, uh, little rings around his arm that kind of uh, uh, grip his muscles, kind of of the uh, bicep area. And it says that he had a collar of the same precious material around his neck. So kind of uh, above this, uh, this fur collar, he's got this collar of gold. So let's go ahead and put down here that he has rings of gold. And we're going to use that Latin symbol, AU, for gold. And then above his waist, he has a richly studded belt. So it's got studs in it, in which was short a, uh, stuck a short, straight, two-edged sword. So let's go ahead and draw this belt. This belt's going to come across and uh, kind of grip his waist. But he's got a sword, a sword that extends down. It's a short sword, and it has a handle that extends down with a sharp point so disposed as to hang almost perpendicularly by his side. Behind his seat was a, 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 a scarlet cloth and it was lined with fur and of course he had a short uh, boar spear. Uh, so he is a, a pretty finely dressed guy. We're going to make it put his fingers here, his hands. I'm not a very good hand drawer here, but so he's got his fingers, and uh, uh, so you, you can tell he's got some elements here that kind of show off his wealth. But he's a tough figure. It says that he's short, he's stocky, and he has a kind of a display of wealth. But he's also very heroic. He loves his liberty. Now we're going to move ahead to a section on page 30. So let's go ahead and write in your notes this on page 30. There's a section here about halfway through the page where there's a description of the prior. Of course, this is prior Eimer. And Prior Eimer is the Catholic um, uh, friar that's with them. Prior, he's the head of a, of a monastery. And let's read there about uh, halfway down through 30, page 30. Oswald made a respectful sign of assent. Quote, his brother sits in the seat and usurps the patrimony of a better race, the race of Ulfar, excuse me, Ulfgar of Middleham. But what Norman lord doth not the same? This prior is, they say, a free and jovial priest who loves the wine cup 
and the bugle horn better than bell and book. So, the author here, Sir Walter Scott, describes him as a free, jovial priest. Here, let's write that down. He's, a, he's free, he's not encumbered by rules or regulations. He's a happy, gay type of uh, priest. He loves the wine, wine cup, meaning, what is that? Uh, well, he loves drinking, you know, it means he's often drinking wine. He also loves the bugle horn. What is that? Well, they use a bugle for hunting. So they go on fox hunts. And so uh, it says he loves this more than the bell and the book. Now, what's the bell and the book? Well, in the Catholic Church, they ring bells during the services. And so he would rather be uh, drinking wine. He would rather be on a hunt. He's a jovial priest. He'd rather be doing that than have services. He'd rather be doing these others than holding service or um, reading the Bible. So in other words, he's not a very, uh, what, studious monk. He's more involved with... um, uh, the things of this world, you know, drinking as an example. Now, we also have a section on Brian de Bois-Gilbert right here on page uh, 30. Here's the night. Uh, Bois-Gilbert, said Cedric, still in the musing, half-arguing tone which the habit of living among dependents had accustomed him to employ and which resembled a man who talks to himself rather than to those around him. Bois Gilbert, that name has been spread wide, both for good and evil. They say he is valiant as the bravest of his order, but stained with their usual vices, pride, arrogance, cruelty, and voluptuousness. A hard-hearted man who knows neither fear of earth nor awe of heaven. So say the few warriors who have returned from Palestine. So this description of Brian de Bois-Gilbert, he's valiant as the bravest of his order. He is both good and evil. And he is stained, though, even though he's valiant, he still has, what, his vices. He still has his failings, and he's stained by a number of vices, pride, arrogance, cruelty, voluptuousness, which means lust for women. And so he's, uh, as he's, he uh, struggles with those things. And lastly, it mentions he's hard-hearted. So Brian sounds like a, a guy who's a knight and who's a great warrior, but he is motivated by the wrong things. He's out for gain. He's prideful. He's arrogant. He doesn't seem to be a true knight of, um, you know, trying to be a knight knight of the temple in Jerusalem, a, a Templar knight. He seems to be sort of a worldly knight. So we're going to go now to part three as we continue And we're uh, going to finish up with a couple quotes that I'd like you to uh, write down. Let's go to part three.